All right. So uh, we are at October 13th and we're having the member conference call and we've already got two solid topics to go with. And then there were some stocks that people emailed me, some other members emailed and I thought they were kind of neat to look at. Of course, if you guys have stocks you guys want to talk about, we'll save those towards the latter part of the call. And um, we'll start with a quick topic, which is going to be earnings. You know, we're, we've started earnings. I think we got off on a positive note with banks coming out and announcing and those stocks really rallied. And on Monday, we're going to have one earnings report and it's a small company. I, I'm really not familiar with it, but Tuesday, from Tuesday on, it's going to be a marathon. It's going to be information overload. It's going to be a lot of things happening. The biggest uh, stock on Tuesday it's going to announce is United Healthcare. That being the biggest market cap for healthcare payers, it's going to set the table for everyone else. Everybody else that's a healthcare payer is going to go up or down based on United Healthcare's earnings and whatever they say in their earnings call. Johnson and Johnson, another healthcare company, a bank in, in Bank of America. Goldman Sachs, Schwab, Citigroup, another big bank, financials, financials, not familiar with this company. United Airlines is on, it's on Tuesday. So we just have information overload, which is going to be neat to see the market react. Based on, I think Tuesday is pretty big for healthcare and for financials. If Bank of America and Citigroup kind of hold serve that JP Morgan and Wells Fargo put out there as well as BlackRock. I think financials are going to do fine. And then healthcare, this is like the real first big day in healthcare. As we move to Wednesday, we have a big semiconductor related company, ASML, which makes all the big machines that the semiconductor foundries, they buy those big giant machines that cost millions and then put them in production. We have another healthcare company, financial services, financials, logistics, um, which would be an industrial. And it just continues on. It's going to be really hard to keep up. I'm trying to look for the first big day of, of uh, technology. And I don't consider Netflix a big technology player. They're, they're a media company. So we're going to have to wait until, see, Monday the Monday the 23rd, TSM. That's going to be really, really interesting. And that's, I'm getting too far into the future, but that's going to be really interesting to see how semiconductors are really selling because their volumes will tell us, okay, NVIDIA, Broadcom, these high-flying stocks, they're going to continue to go on because TSM, their volumes are really, really high, their production volumes. But if their production volumes come in and they're lower, it'll be like, head scratcher why, why are semiconductors rallying so much it's uh i think the story has gotten ahead of of reality so that's uh we've got an interesting week of earnings we will uh see how things go go ahead scott hey thanks i just have a quick question about when to expect earnings because to be honest it's not something i paid a lot of attention to until starting this year and it seems like Swiss companies report after, like they tend to report later. Like I was just looking at the calendar and the first major Swiss company to report is ABB, right? Which is a big industrial company. Mm -hmm. And that's not until the 17th. Oh, well, I guess that's next week. But is it correct that the US and maybe Chinese stocks tend to report earlier? Because I know you invest globally as well. Right. So I'm yeah. just curious with your experience with that. I don't I don't have enough experience to give you a really good answer there. Um, okay. I'm used to the, you know, they announce every quarter. And I know I, I know Europe, Great Britain, Australia, they announce twice a year. So it's biannual. So it's mm -hmm. not every quarter. I don't know what it is like in Switzerland. I think Switzerland might depend on the company, maybe uh abb i think is doing it by quarter because they say period ending uh what the end if of september but maybe not maybe it's maybe it's financial year right maybe it's uh what's it called yeah, yeah september if, september if they officially 
want to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, they have to announce every right. quarter. So okay. if it's like, hey, like uh, Alibaba is a Chinese company that's yeah. listed in the uh, Shanghai ex Exchange, but it's also listed in the New York Stock Exchange. Well, if you want to keep keep your listing on the New York Stock Exchange, you must announce your earnings every quarter and you must comply with the SEC rules. Okay. Interesting. So Novartis must do that too, because they're also listed on the, even though it's an ADR, right? So it's the US dollars, but I guess they also have to report quarterly. You have to, or else the, okay. the, you will not be listed. Okay. The, uh, the behavior that, you know, corresponds to earnings. I think earnings is a, you know, as, as the whole industry, right? As soon as earnings come out, you see that analysts will restate their models. They'll look at the data, they'll process the data, and they'll revisit their expectation and their thesis on a stock. Meaning, here's the story on United Healthcare. You know, I'm expecting that they're going to grow two to four percent. They're going to maintain their profitability, their free cash flow, and they'll reveal things like how many people they're covering with their health insurance plan and those types of things. That's the same thing I do on earnings, but with my analysis, like. Uh, I don't own United Healthcare. I owned it for multiple years. I owned United Healthcare for a long time. Then I switched to Elevance. Um, but Citigroup is one of my stocks, right? Now I'm holding Citigroup. I'm looking for their data and I'm looking to see are they, what's the projection in 2025? Is it going to be more favorable than what I'm currently expecting? Does it change? what I expect out of the stock and, and the value of the stock. So I just kind of go through that train of thought, kind of go through from, from start to finish and kind of rethink through the, the stock. And is it a stock that still is on the same journey and path that I expected the company to go in or near, near? And, um, and do I want to continue to hold? Should I buy more shares? Should I sell some shares? I'm probably not going to sell any shares, but, that's kind of like the logic of, of earnings. And I've gotten used to it. Every earnings, you know, hey, when a company announces and I own it, I go through their financials, I read their their uh, their comments. I'll sit in on a couple of earnings calls. I wish I had enough time to, you know, sit in on all calls. I might even listen to a recording, especially if the stock really moves. I'll listen to the earnings call to see, well, you know, why did it go up so much or why did it go down so much? And let me listen to the earnings call. What did they say? Were they really being pressed and um, go through it? So what do you guys do when earnings, you know, come out? I know, Scott, you kind of shared a little bit of your comments, but any other comments you have or uh, Enkider or Brad, what do you guys do when earnings come out? I do try to listen to those some of them kind of like what you said i don't get to to listen to all of them i do listen to recordings but normally my bigger holdings i try to go back and listen to and I update actually with your model I'll update the model um once the financials come out very good i i tend to because i'm also an options trader right so now i do try to avoid earnings in my options unless there's some really good reason why i'd want to um to to play something with that but as far as listening to earnings calls that i usually only do when a, uh, a company is maybe i'm interested to see if i should consider investing or for to see if maybe i i think they're a little bit speculative right so like robin hood to me right would be more interesting for me to listen to than like i don't know jp morgan chase mm -hmm. right um i also i should add I'm actually considering going to an investors meeting or what do they call it? You know, the, right, right. the actual yearly stockholders meetings because of where I live, I invest in Swiss companies too. And because I, I have the transit pass, right? So it's like mm -hmm. if uh, UBS or Novartis has a shareholders meeting, um, if it's an hour away by train, maybe I should just go right. Then uh, hobnob have some free food. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's free, but. <laughs> That'd be interesting. You know, I've I've yet to attend one in person. I've attended many like remote. 
And I think the United States a little harder, right? Um, because, you know, I'd have to get on an airplane to go anywhere to, to go to an earnings meeting or annual meeting, I should say. Um, but that's pretty cool. I think that'd be interesting to do. Yeah, I'll, I'll report what I find. But, cool. But Scott, uh, are you referring to investor day or to annual meeting? I mean, I think that I, 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 I joined one or two annual me meetings, but you know, for remote, not uh, not on site. And it was quite boring. Like what we were talking about is who who they are nominating to right. a director and who is who is who is not something like that. It was I said, oh, there's no no information here. Yeah, good point. Yeah, probably the most famous investor day is Berkshire Hathaway, right? They make it yeah. kind of a a big uh, like carnival because they bring all their companies together and um, serve out food and make it kind of a festival setting. And they they bring, do it in Nebraska, I believe. So not, not yeah, and also people are always waiting with bated breath for um, you know the Oracle of Omaha's speech, right? For Buffett's, he always yeah. has some kind of. And he has questions and answers, and so yeah, I guess that would—that's what I have in my mind. But yeah, you're probably right, Noam, that in reality, most of them are going to be more boring. It yeah, also yeah. might be in German here. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Good. So it's—it's it's going to be again. I—I um, I keep. I keep saying it and I don't know that I'm ready for earnings because <laughs> as you'll see, like a month from now, we'll be like, at least I'll feel like, Oh my God, if I have to listen to one more <laughs> earnings call, I think I'm going to quit investing altogether. I'm so tired of all this information. It's like, it's almost like finals in college or high school and lasting a whole month. It's like, okay, I'm done. And Let's and part on. of what that makes it frustrating, I suppose, is sorting through the marketing, right? Sorting through the jargon and the marketing to say, okay, what are the facts? What did you earn? What are the risks here? What is the and, bad news, right? And how and you they read, try to always minimize the bad news, right? You, Hide it. You read some financials, like for example, we saw JP Morgan and Wells Fargo, and we saw that their overall revenues went down. The expectation for lower interest rates is going to assist them. Now, the stock went up 5%. So it's a little bit of counterintuitive. It's like, okay, revenue went down, stock went up, the perception of, well, banks are going to do well going forward. And enough of the fundamentals show that, that the projection into 2025 is favorable for that bank. And what I find it a little fatiguing is, we just got through one big day of earnings and you have to like think outside the box and you have to think through, you know, rationalizing this is, these are the fundamentals I'm seeing and his, the, it, here's how the stock behaved. Well, when you do that day after day for three, four, five, six, seven consecutive weeks, you kind of get tired of it. You're like, Oh my God, man, <laughs> it's okay. I've had enough. And then finally they'll end and you'll be like, all right, great. I don't have to do that for a little while. Uh, hopefully we get through these earnings in a positive way and stocks go up. But we'll see. We'll see. I think there's potential for some fireworks to be lit this week. And I, I tell you, to me, one interesting part of the earnings is the Q&A at the end. Because, you know, the presentations are always, they're geared towards the good news. And there's you know probably some bad news in there. But the questions at the end, when, they're, when they take questions from everybody is really what's interesting and i like listening to that yeah i agree i agree good point all right so we'll continue to talk about earnings and that'll be especially around the live streams that's going to be a big part of the live streams for the next four weeks um let's talk about taxes so um i want to open up with like and i'm going to try to put that right here um not a big like i don't have a lot of content ready for taxes but just to qualify like my perspective on taxes so i graduated in accounting and i got educated in tax through my curriculum and i've always done my like 
when I hit 18, I started doing my own taxes. I started doing all my family's taxes. I started my, some of my siblings started businesses. I would do their taxes. I would do their accounting. And then I became a professional accountant. And um, so taxes is kind of like a thing that I've done, right? I've done it ever since. And now that I'm a you know stock investor, um, it's a little bit of second nature to me. I know the tax code quite well. I kind of know how to, you know, use it to to in my favor. Um, as we approach the end of the year, it is, it's most definitely a very important topic to talk about because if you're, if if you do, if, if you have a couple of stocks that are losing value and let's say you have a stock that you're down 30%, you can harvest that, that loss, sit, sit out for 30 days and then get back into the position. And then you have that loss to match up against a gain. And then you're really not, you're not paying tax per se. And that's a very, uh, I think a wise thing to think about. If you are, if you do have some, some stocks that are down, you can harvest those losses, get them ready to match them up against a winner. Now, it doesn't mean that you just sell winners just blindly like, okay, great. I got this tax loss. So I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. Um, it would be more of the most important thing in my mind is maintaining the, the, the strategy and plan on a particular stock like meta. I don't want to sell meta period. I don't want to say Google, sell Google alphabet. And there's some stocks where it's like, yeah, it's just, I don't want to sell them. But there's some stocks where I'm like, you know, uh, it was it was always the intent that it would be a holding for a period of time. It could have been a year, it could have been three years, but it wasn't a stock where I'm like just crazy about it. Like Citigroup, Citigroup's a good stock, but it's not like I don't expect Citi's going to be worth ten times its value in ten years. Um, I think it's a good stock, and I think it was a good time when I bought it, and I'm sitting on a good gain. And it pays a good dividend. I think it's going to be a good hold stock for 2025. Great. I'm, I'm good with it. I'm not going to sell it. But I talked about Zim and how I, when I bought the stock, I already had an intent to own it for a while and then sell it. Um, Starbucks presented an opportunity to liquidate that position after a very, very quick rise. I'm like, okay. I don't think Starbucks is going to go up a lot more in you know six months to twelve months. So I sold those two stocks. I am sitting on a pretty. I'm I'm going to pay taxes this year. Um, uh, not going to be able to harvest a whole lot of uh, losses. But that's I'd rather keep my investing strategy intact. And I didn't like sell a ton of stocks. Right, I sold a couple positions, and I'm sitting on some gains. Um, everything else is kind of staying invested, and I'm going to ride that through the end of the year. But that's one way to, um, you know, think about it is as you approach the end of the year, if you do have a share that you were thinking of selling and you felt like you can pay taxes, well, if you do have a share like like Intel, I sold Intel at a loss, so that's going to be, in a way, a benefit to me or an asset, I should say. And, you know, psychologically, I think to myself when I take chances on stocks, because, I mean, I've been paying taxes my whole adult life. I'm 56. So um, that's a long time. And the last 10 years, I have pay paid plenty of taxes, <laughs> plenty of taxes. Now, when I invest, especially in a riskier stock, I really do feel like I'm in partnership with the government. Because if I do have a loss in that investment, they're going to split it with me. Because that loss, when I recognize it, is going to go against my tax liability. In the U.S., yeah, the federal and the state taxes combined, roughly, it's 50% for me. So maybe a little less, like 38. And so I'm in partnership with the government. If I lose money, I lost 62 cents on a dollar. The government lost 38 cents on a dollar. And, and I go for it. 
Scott, you had a question or a comment? Uh, sometimes you're in partnership with multiple governments, right? <laughs> and when you invest, uh, you know, for example, in Zim. <laughs> um, but I did have a comment. Actually, circling back to um, the gnome's comments, right, and Guider's comments from the beginning, you bring up a perfect example in Zim because uh, I would also add that this is where you can use your location in the world and your status, right, your personal situation to the as best of the advantage as you can, right? So for example, with, and you didn't mention this, but this is another tax, right? It's a dividend withholding. So for me, in my personal case, I mean, the, some of my tax situation, is, it's not worth getting into, it's just too complicated. But being that I'm American here in Switzerland, so I can invest in US stocks and ETFs without withholding. And I can also invest in Swiss stocks and although they withhold, it's basically like tax withholding for me, and I can reclaim it. And so for Gnome, being in Israel, I mean, that might make sense to invest in Israeli companies because he would get 100% of the dividend, I think, right? So he would know more than I would, but it's just an example. And so my personal situation, I basically don't know yet if I'm going to have to worry about capital gains um, because I don't know if they're going to classify me as a professional investor yet. <laughs> so I'll, I'll get back to you on that next year because this is the year, right? It's always a year behind. This is the year I started investing much more heavily. So yeah, we'll see. So, so let me go over a, a couple of, go ahead, Brad. Just a quick question, Victor, on, on your Zim purchase. So did, you went in knowing that at some point you would, uh sell it so what prompted you to sell it did you see a better opportunity in another stock and you decided to sell them and then reinvest or did was it just that time for you to sell it yeah so um with zim i so zim is really affected by shipping rates and shipping rates can you know really move like a couple of years ago they were like literally 10 times higher and they really dropped then they rose those shipping rates um tend to be super cyclical like you have these cycles and they last maybe two three years having said that i knew that buying zim was going to be a one two year investment so that was always like okay that's the category i put the stock in now as i continue in 2024 just my spidey senses are that hey, it's great that our stocks are going up in general. Some stocks are going down, but a majority of stocks are going up. Well, that's great, but I think there's going to come a time when we're going to give up some of those gains. It's just that stock market does it over and over again. I didn't feel like I had enough cash. So I wanted to generate cash. And so I went through my portfolio and almost started to think about which is the weakest stock or the stock that I should be selling that's I'm ready to sell, okay? So that's how I decided on Zim and that's how I decided on Starbucks is I want more cash. And then boom, boom, I sold those two positions. I did get some feedback that was quite useful, by the way, I think Scott on Discord said, hey, uh, it's interesting how you dollar cost average in, but then you sell all at once coming out. So I actually thought, you know, that's a good point. And I dollar cost averaged my exit out of Starbucks into three different separate sales events. Zim, I did it all at once. I was like, all right, Zim's off the portfolio. Boom, sold it. <laughs> so that was the reason, Brad. Um, do I have stocks right now that are in that? I'm going to own them temporarily. I probably have one or two, but most of them are like, no, If, if unless the story changes, like Intel, the story went from it being a kind of a bounce back story, like, hey, I think they're going to come back to holy smokes. I knew they were screwed up, but I didn't think they were that screwed up. <laughs> I got to get out of it. Does that answer your question, Brad? Yes. Thank you. So let's talk about a couple of just kind of fundamentals around taxes, right? So if you own a stock for less than a year, and you sell it with a gain, 
and that's short-term capital gains. In the United States, that's realized as ordinary income, which means it's like you made a paycheck and let's say you work for UPS, United Parcel Service, and they pay you a salary. It'd be like receiving those salary payments and you would put them on your taxes. It'd be ordinary income. Your dividends are ordinary income. All right, so you own a stock for one year, one year, one day. It changes to a long-term capital gain. And the tax rate on long-term capital gains at the Fed level, I believe, is 15%. And But the state of California says, we're so proud of you. I'm now, now is my humor time. We're so proud of you making that good investment that we'd like 12.5% of that. <laughs> So it's 27.5% combined for me. And now in the state of uh, Georgia, it's probably different, right? If you're in Florida, as an example, they don't have state income tax. So it'd just be 15%, which is why, hmm, I wonder why so many retired Americans are moving to Florida. <laughs> Maybe because they want to take the long-term capital gains tax as a resident of Florida or Nevada or somewhere where they don't have state income tax. So Long-term capital gains, short-term capital gains. Those are concepts to just uh, keep an eye on. Um, now, harvesting tax losses. That is very common. Um, as we approach the end of the year, you harvest some of your losses, and then you're, you're in a good place. Coming out of 2022, I think I had some losses to harvest in 2023, but we've had back-to-back good years. 23 was a very good year. 24 is a very good year. So where I can harvest losses has become pretty limited. The good news on 22 was I sold a real estate asset at a huge gain. And I was able to harvest some of my tax losses, get out of those positions for 30 days, and then get back into them. So you got it. So the US government will penalize you if you get out of a stock and go back into it within 30 days they will say no we see what you're trying to do we're going to give you the previous acquisition uh cost basis so those are uh wash sales and so you have to stay out of the position for 30 days it's really important and then you can come back into it so you have to be you have to understand that, hey, um, let's say I was, I, let's say I still owned Intel and I still believe in Intel at this moment. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to sell it because I'm losing money on it. I want to harvest that loss in order to apply it toward my Zim profit or my Starbucks profit. And you're able to, uh, you're able to associate that loss to either a short term capital gain or a long term capital gain. I would get, I would get out of Intel, I would sell Intel. And I would sell it all at once, by the way, if I'm trying to harvest it, because if you dollar cost average out, it's going to take longer. It's going to make your life more complicated. So I would sell it with the intent that in 31 days, I am buying Intel back if I still believed in Intel. So I would get out, come back in 31 days. I now own Intel. My What's my risk is Intel goes up 20% in value. That's risk. But the savings is substantial because on short-term capital gains, it's saving me 37 and a half percent. If I was, that's on a long-term gain, excuse me. If it's ordinary income, it's closer to 50%. So that's how you have to start maneuvering toward the end of the year. So tax planning is a very good topic to be talking about right now or to be thinking about right now because it could save you a lot of money. Okay. And then the last thing I would say, and I'm going to get, get to you, Scott, is oh. so if, if you're like, you know, this company's done great. Um, I'm okay selling it. I'm okay holding it, but I would probably want to get out of it for the next six months. Well, for sure, don't sell it in the United States until January 1. Because <laughs> then if you sold the stock, you know, January 2nd officially, because Jan 1, the brokerages and the stock market will be closed. Uh, but you sold, you sell it January 2nd, you will not have to pay tax until, you know, April of 26. So you're like, 
cash flow wise, you'll get to invest that that profit for another year, as opposed to if, if you sell it now, the tax will be due in April of 25. So that's another thing. Scott, you had a comment or question? I, I had a quick comment. It's just something I learned from living here. And so the downside of living in a place with no capital gains uh, uh, taxes on stocks, well, number one, there's actually a wealth tax here, but that's another story. So the thought of Switzerland as the tax haven may no longer be accurate. But the other thing is the, the downside of having no capital gains tax is there's also no capital loss. You see what I'm saying? So if you lose money, you also can't claim the loss. Ah. So you keep that in mind if you move to any place with no capital gains tax on, on stocks. Got it. Well, that seems fair. I mean, you can't have it both ways. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. But so, is, there any, is, is there any timing on, I know you mentioned that if you own a stock less than a year and you have a gain, it's treated different. Is there any type of timing on a loss? So whether you had the stock six months or you had it five years, a loss is a loss. A loss is a loss. Okay. There's a uh, the one the one caveat is you, you know those stocks that are limited partnerships, LPs. Like That's a correct. lot of the uh, energy companies, especially those uh, pipeline companies, they're limited partnerships. Right. So. Everything I've shared with you is generally most stocks. It could be a bank stock, a, a REIT. It could be just about any stock except for those limited partnerships, which are almost you're a part owner in that business. And with those, the taxes are different. Um, and I don't want to talk about them because they're complicated and more distracting than they are. If you own a limited partnership, stock and you're going to execute like a sell um just google search it get yourself ready and then your taxes are going to be a little more complicated but they're treated completely different everything i just shared is every single tax now if you bought a stock on monday and sold it on friday and unfortunately lost 25 percent, you can apply that 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 loss against any of your wins whether it be a short-term capital gain or a long-term capital gain. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So very good topic. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, it reminds me to keep thinking about it and um, everybody else should think about, you know, what are you, what you're going to do tax wise. So and Kiter, you have, you had a comment and where's my chat? Here it is. So DV is a stock, is that right? Yes, yes, Victor, I, 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 I shift the course uh, if, that's, if that's okay. I mean, if we finish. Yeah, yeah, perfect. That sounds good. So, I think we were, we were at yeah. the end of taxes, yeah. unless somebody has one more question. Well, I will just mention, I, yeah, I may ask you about limited partnerships in the future because a, a company I hold, the BEPC, right, Brooklyn Renewable, it's going to become a limited partnership mm -hmm. as part of the merger. So that's something I'm going to have to learn about later. Yeah, they're, uh, they're like limited partnerships can be a tax benefit if you're a huge investor in that company, because it's almost like if like that company lost money, you can take those losses against your income taxes. So the limited partnerships become quite lucrative for an investor that really believes in that business. Like in energy, they're very popular because they're like, hey, we're gonna build out this pipeline for the first five years, we're gonna lose money. But then every year after that, we're gonna make tons of money. Okay, great. So for the first five years, a wealthy person buys in that limited partnership and they're able to deduct those losses that the business took, right? You didn't sell your stock, but the business lost lots of money. And let's say you're a big stockholder and my portion of those losses is $25,000.
I can take that 25,000 against my tax liability and it's completely deductible. Okay. So that's one, of, one thing that applies in limited partnerships. Not hoping your limited partnership loses money, but if they do in the US, it's actually an asset to you. You can apply it against your tax liability. Okay, thanks. Sorry to interrupt, Kyder. Yeah, and taxes is kind of a topic where uh, I think it's interesting, but um, it could be quite boring to most people. <laughs> I can talk to my wife for about two seconds about taxes, and then she's like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about, I think you want to look at stocks, and, and that'd be great. That'd be great. I think we handled earnings, taxes. Now let's talk about stocks. So and Kiter, if I have the symbol correct, you want to look at double verify holdings. Is that correct? Yes. And okay. they are in the business of advertisement or supporting advertisement. Okay. Yeah, you're cutting out a little bit, but I get you, which is they're they're listed as a software platform for digital media measurement data analytics and so forth so we saw a company similar to this but a little different which was called app lovin yesterday in the live stream this and it looked really interesting let's see where this one stacks up so this is a small cap 2.9 billion let me look at something really quick so these guys are united states company they're headquartered in new york so they help you know companies that are advertising companies advertise online now that's the way they get the best return on investment when you're you're an, you're an advertising company or i should say when you're a company trying to advertise your product or service so that's where they're at their solutions are brand awareness marketplaces publishers retail media okay innovation okay so they probably provide their platform as a service, right? They're, they're saying, hey, if you wanna be with us, you can use our platform and we'll charge you a monthly fee for the amount of advertising you do or the amount of people that you have on our platform. That way you can advertise and then measure the success of that advertisement to see how many people visited links how many people came to your website they were interested in your product or service and even they ordered that product or service based on the advertisement that we put out there okay so i i understand their business it's a small business let's take a look at their pe is a little high this year but we're so close to 25 i'm already starting to look at 25 because we're we just ended the the third quarter and we're moving on to 2025, I am most certainly. It's a buy and it's 81% discounted. Wow, why is that? Well, I think part of it is the stock's down quite a bit and it's really down from February 20th of this year. It really fell off a cliff. Wow, went from $42 a share to 17. Wow, that's a big drop. Meanwhile, the revenue keeps going up. Well, those two, those two trends are different. Like stock really dropped, but the revenue has been rising. So when I look at the quarterly, they're still rising the revenue. Okay. So let's keep digging in here. So we have revenue that's been rising on this company. They are profitable, okay, and they do provide really good free cash flow. So based, yeah, this company, I'll be able to determine just based on fundamentals, you know, that you could probably buy this company at fair value or a discount. Now that big drop, let's look at their balance sheet and and then I'll look at the the news. Was there like a big story that really affected their stock? Are they being sued or something like that? From, from what I read, I'm still trying to understand better the technology. 
but from what I read, no, nothing like that. It's just that they were kind of conservative in their uh, forecast in the last quarter or something like that. And then that makes the investors never nervous. Okay. That's my understanding. Yeah. I mean, I'm I, I totally maybe missing something, but I didn't see any any event, you know, any crowd strike event or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So they have a strong balance sheet. They have way more cash than they do debt. They have very little debt. So the company is in really good financial position. They have plenty, plenty of cash to operate with, and they keep generating more cash. So this company is strong. They're growing their revenue. They're generating free cash. Now, let me look at through these stories really quick, and it's gonna be hard to go back like nine months. So in general, I would say this is an interesting stock worth more attention, potentially, if you can figure out if, if there, it's a good acquisition price and you think they're gonna keep going up higher. I mean, one analyst believes this stock can go up to $45 a share. And the worst analyst is at $19 a share. This is based on earnings per share. Earnings per share is going to jump up to 46 cents a share next year, meaning 2025. I'd already take this number. So this is a really interesting company. When you think about their space, Double Verify is in a very fertile space. Companies are advertising online using digital media more than ever. Case in point, I'm a college football fan, but I don't have a lot of time. And yesterday I had a lot of stuff going on and I had a really nice day. But I wanted to see the highlights of the uh, Ohio State, uh, Oregon football game. So I go on YouTube and I watched it and it summarized it and I was able to watch it. It's all digital now. Now, 20 years ago, we would go on ESPN, right? So cable was all the craze. People wanted to advertise on cable because guys like me would go on ESPN and watch highlights. But now we go on YouTube. I want to see the Oregon, Oregon versus uh, Ohio State highlights. Boom, it's in front of me. So advertisers know that. And they want to use solutions like Double Verify to make their investment in advertising pay off. So they're in a very fertile space that's that's here to stay. It's going to be good for a while. It's not like, hey, this space is terrible. I just can't get my head around why the stock price fell so much in early 2024, and I need to get an explanation. I'd probably take too much time doing it now. It'd probably take like 15, 20 minutes just to kind of get my uh, my head around that. But I think that's the homework on this stock to see if, wow, this stock's just really misunderstood. This is like Zim all over again. It's misunderstood. It's a great acquisition price. I'm going for it. Um, put in you know, some, some capital and watch the stock rise because I'm seeing a lot of good things. I'm seeing revenue growth. They're profitable, free cash flow. Balance sheet's great. They're in the right industry. You know, I've seen a lot of green flags here. I just, I'm trying to figure out why did the market punish this stock so severely twice from here to here, from here to here. I don't know if this has a bearing, but one of their biggest customers is TikTok. Oh, and the whole threat of TikTok being banned. Yeah. Bingo. I think that's it. And Kyder is. Do you believe? Who, uh, sorry, who, who was saying that? Uh, Brad. You know that? Yeah, it looks like one of their biggest customers is TikTok. Mm. That makes sense, and Kyder, you know why? Because especially like if uh, if the Republicans yeah, win the presidency, they they were they were all over TikTok. Like we're gonna ban that, right? Or I don't. I think both of them dislike TikTok, so I, either president's probably going to ban TikTok. That's interesting. I will. I will search for it because from what I 
read their customers are actually uh, retailers. I mean, and also I looked at their presentation, their retail, their customers are, 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 are organizations like uh, Ulta Beauty and You're Hotel. right, you're correct. Yeah. It's just those advertisers are advertising on TikTok. Yeah. And double verify may, may be really good at advertising on TikTok for all those companies you listed. And if TikTok is not accessible in the U.S. anymore, it takes yeah. away a big part of their business. Yeah. Yeah, Victor, if you tap in on the Meta AI, uh, their clients, it should it should pop back up TikTok. And uh, another one was Zupalu. I don't know who that is. Um, when I typed it in. It didn't specify that I actually TikTok. typed in uh double verify holdings. I typed the whole name in when I uh, searched. Mm Yours is different than mine. Yeah. I got, I got a different answer. But I think the answer you got, the answer you you got makes this rational, right? If Because mm -hmm. I know that TikTok, the government's really after TikTok. Like, hey, we want you, they want the, the U.S.-based TikTok service to be sold to a U.S. company. Because the, the data that TikTok uh, has on everyone that uses TikTok, they feel is a national threat. They don't want a foreign government, specifically like China, to have that data. So they're like, you have to sell it to a U.S. company. Well, if you, TikTok ceases to exist in the U.S., this, the threat of it makes sense that you would have a stock you know, just kind of get sold off on that threat. It's not fundamental based. It's more of a story based. Like, hey, if TikTok gets banned, that is going to happen. You know, the fundamentals will follow that story if it gets banned. So that makes sense. I think it gives you kind of something to start with, and Kiter, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look into it as well. And um, I really liked App Lovin', but it's an expensive stock. It's like, oof. Man, I'm kind of late to the party. This one here, these are kind of stories that, you know, if if you follow the the whole, you know, the the principal reason why this stock's going down, and you just get ahead of it a little bit, you can really make a good return. So good one. Okay. Let's double verify. <laughs> Any other stocks you guys want to look at? I got a financial I'd like for you to take a look at if you could. Okay. It is RF. So Regions Financial? Yep. Yeah. So Regions Financial, a financial holding company, provides banking, banking related services to individual and corporate customers. So this is like a mid sized bank or a small bank? It is regional, regional bank. bank. Yes, pretty much in the east. Good. Yeah. So these guys have had a good year because last year, if you look at the Silicon Valley Bank um, sell off, it happened in 2023 and just created a lot of fear in this space. And it was kind of unwarranted. And then it just really took off. Um, we got good news from the big banks, and it's going to continue to, uh, I think, trickle down to the small banks. You know, as big banks go, 
small banks will kind of be affected. Smaller banks are more profitable, but they're also um, a couple of things is investors don't buy small banks like they do big banks. Like JP Morgan's a really well known household name. These they really do well. I mean, forty two percent is great. Good dividend, low PE, low PE for twenty twenty five. Um, let's take a look at there. So there's two things I look at in a bank that are important to me is book value and earnings per share. And earnings per share is going to be given to us here. This is a pretty good analysis. There's 17 analysts covering this stock. So that's a pretty good coverage. And some analysts, one one or a couple analysts believe it's a $28 stock. Some believe it's priced 3%, a little too high because it's been doing really well. Stock price has been up. And then one analyst thinks it's overpriced. So when we look at their earnings per share, it's going to grow nicely in 25 and continue to grow in 26. Looks good. Their PE is going to drop to 10. This really looks good. Okay. So 228 per share in profit. What's their dividend? So their dividend's a dollar. They can more than afford this dividend rate. So they're they're in good shape. I like to look at book value. It's the second metric that shows the value of the company. And you can find book value on the balance sheet section. And we're going to have book value per share right here. And book value per share has been going up slightly, but kind of staying flat. You see how it's 2019 is 1565, 1713, 1769. We had a setback in 22. The economy was, or I should say the stock market was pretty rough. Um, and then 17, then it's kind of dropped back in the trailing 12 months. So th this truly is a measure here from 2019 to 2023. It looks like it did rise. So the book value is rising. Um, I think part of, let's see here. Yeah, the book value has risen a little bit. It's not very impressive, but I think the earnings per share number looks really strong. Um, how well are banks going to do for the following 12 months? I think they're going to do okay. But um, not as good as this the past 12 months. Uh, I would think that this stock's maybe going to do 10 to 20 percent appreciation, and this dividend looks nice. So I can't argue with somebody wanting to buy a regional bank, especially if do these guys operate in your region? Like, do they operate in Georgia? Yeah, they they do. So I bought U.S. Bank, um, and I'm a U.S. Bank um, account holder. And they operate here in California, and I'm sure they operate in a bunch of other places. And I noticed what they were doing in the market, and I'm like, you know, let me look at their fundamentals. They look good. I bought it and made money, and I sold it in 2024. And because I saw the big rise coming out of this, you know, big drop in 23, and I bought it, and then it went up, and then I sold it. And I kind of just kept. Citigroup because it was a bigger bank. Um, I think this is a this is a good stock. Nice low market cap. Revenue looks good. There, there are no red flags on this one. What what's your intent on a stock like this? What what would you be? Why would you own a stock like this if you're considering buying it? Well, I think what you said. You know, I guess the biggest question was: Is the rise it's had for the last year? Is you know, is it already? Has it already gone too high? But you know, I would like to get 25, 30 percent out of it. Um, I don't know. If, I don't think it's a double stock, but I think it is a uh, um, a good stock for a good, especially with the interest rates being cut. And they're always busy. If I go by and see them. They're they're always busy at that bank, at all the banks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if the economy does well, small banks are going to do well. Um. If we go into any kind of recession, small banks are going to be, be hit hard. And you got to also take a look at which industries, some regional banks 
tend to um, be exposed to certain industries. For example, a while back, I owned a small bank that was called uh, Midwest Midwest Bank, and they were like in Illinois, and a lot of their financing was to farmers. A lot of their financing was in the industries that kind of surrounded them in Iowa and Indiana and Missouri and, and places like that. So I was able to kind of think to myself, okay, are those industries going to do well for the next couple of years? Or is Midwest Bank going to be dealing with some losses, right? So I would also encourage you to look at that and say, hey, Regions Financial, because they're making loans to a lot of businesses probably, right? And you you wouldn't want to see that, oh yeah, I made a bunch of loans to a big office office uh, office space uh, a builder or a construction company or a, a property manager that owns office buildings. That'd be really risky right now because that industry is really lagging. But if they if they lent to industries that are going to do well for the next couple of years, that'd be just a good factor to consider. Thank you. Scott, you got a question? Oh, just to jump in here. Uh, that's cool that in stock analysis shows you the book value per share. I didn't know that. And so, yeah, for example, with UBS, right? Because they had that, uh, what I call a shotgun wedding with Credit Suisse. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you can see the book value per, per share jumped up. I mean, what is that? Like 50% almost uh, 2022 to 2023 year over year. And so Correct. now there were other issues in the balance sheet, right? Because there's a bunch of debt they had to take over, yada, yada, integration. And then, but that is, uh, that is something that probably would just stand out. If you didn't know anything about the company, I imagine someone looking at, whoa, what happened? <laughs> How did the book value jump up so much? That acquisition, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, financial services has really had a good month. Um, I think I have, so here are the sectors, right? So financials is in third place for the last 12 months. Technology being number one, communication services number two, and then financials number three. I mean, it's a pretty good sector. And I think it's going to keep doing well if the economy continues to do well. There's going to be a lot of refinancing activity too. Like the refinancing activity for home mortgages now that, like two, three years ago, two years ago, interest rates were really high. Now they've dropped so much that the volume of refinancing is really high. Well, that gives banks access to fees, restructuring debt. There's just a lot of money for banks to make in, in a time when everybody's refi refinancing. All right, great. So any other stocks you guys want to talk about? I can't think of any right now. All right. So we'll, we'll kind of end it there. We talked about uh, the principal topic being tax, which was a good one. And then just kind of going through earnings and uh, getting ready for it, getting ready for the big, big uh, volume of information that's going to flow our way for the next month. And uh, it'll be a really interesting month once again. And then once we get tired of it, we, take a month off, maybe a month and a half, and then it starts all over again. <laughs> so. You know, if I can, I have a thought for a future conference call. And uh, you're talking about dollar cost averaging, right? Uh -huh. And so it might be interesting to see dollar when to dollar cost average, when to lump sum invest and the advantages, disadvantages. I mean, obviously not everyone can lump sum invest, right? Mm -hmm. But in situations when you can, like, you get inheritance, you sell a bunch of stock or whatever, a windfall of some sort. It's just, it might be interesting to compare and contrast and hear people's experiences. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And in some cases, that'd be a very good topic because what comes to mind is in some asset classes, like real estate, you can't dollar cost average. But that's a it's not like you can go to a property and say, hey, you know, I like the property, but I'd like to buy like 2% at a time until I have 100% ownership. The owner would be like, no, that's not how it works. 
you have to commit to buying the property. There'll be a date, there'll be a, a price that you pay for the property and you can finance the purchase. You can leverage the purchase, but you own that property. There's no choice. You can't dollar cost average. You know, you decided on a price and then if the property value goes up, you, you, you appreciated, uh, you know, your investment appreciated. If the property value goes down, you lost money. So you don't have a choice. Well, stocks give you the choice and it's such a great choice that I guess we could just have more of a philosophical discussion around, because it, it really shouldn't be, uh, hey, this is the way to do it. And everybody should follow that way. It really should be, how do you like to invest? How do you like to analyze companies? You know, are you more comfortable with dollar cost averaging and analyzing a company over time, continue to buy into a stock? Or are you more comfortable with, I want to, I want to make decisions on a stock three, four times a year and then set it and forget it. I'm, I'm too busy enjoying my life and traveling and I don't want to be dollar cost averaging every week, every month. I want to set it and forget it. Hey, that's awesome. I'm glad that you picked lane, just drive in that lane, do your thing. So it's really a choice. Yeah. I mean, you could also in theory, uh, like do recurring investments, right? So you could actually set and forget dollar cost averaging, but you would still want to keep that in mind, right? I mean, at some point, <laughs> if the company, you know, starts going downhill, obviously you might want to turn that off. You're going, you're going in where I was going to go, which is if you're a person like me, I want to keep up with like, like a Google alphabet, right? They've, they've had a lot of headwinds and their stock prices kind of hasn't kept up with meta or the other big giant companies. Well, is that an opportunity or is that a sign that I should be pausing my investment in Google alphabet? Well, I'm an active investor. So I look at the company and I continue to buy shares dollar cost averaging my purchase. Well, if you set it and forget it under those conditions and you, you kind of start, you, you didn't put the, for, for my type of investing, I didn't get a chance to put the thought into it before the transaction was made. So that's a choice that I would rather not do, right? But somebody else may, they'd be like, you know what? I believe in Google Alphabet. I'm gonna have it automatically buy shares and so be it. That, that makes sense. So it's a philosophical question of how do you like to invest? Some people may enjoy the thrill of making a big bet. You know, okay, that's a thrill to some, and that's a fear to others, right? So that'd be a really good philosophical question. And kind of, if you are a dollar cost averager, here's here, let's talk about that. If you are a big bet, you know, uh, investor, let's talk about that. And I think it'd be an interesting conversation. Yeah, I agree. And um, there's at least one study I've seen on it, and I would uh, bring that. Great. Um, all right, guys. Well, very good session. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for supporting the channel. I really appreciate it. And uh, let's just keep collaborating on Discord, on comments, on videos. And I look forward to seeing you guys on the live streams. And you know where to get a hold of me if you need me. Sounds Thank you, good. Victor. All right. Thank Take you. care, guys. Yep. Take Have care. a good day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye, guys. Bye.